All right, ready? And we usually Ricardo does that. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, yeah, it's like in in film they they snap. Okay. Well, you snap. So should I get started? You snap so that when you edit, you can just find the spot. All right. Okay, I'll guess. And I don't know either. Well, out the other. <laughs> All right, everybody. So welcome to another episode of Union or Bust. Uh, organizing monster here, and uh, who do we got here, Chris? How's everyone doing? Chris Lopez, your union brother on TikTok, Instagram, all the platforms. Well, welcome to a special edition, social media edition of the Union or Bus podcast, and we got some big people on here. I uh, just want to introduce John Ryan, uh, aka Union Drip, on Twitter. We have your union sister on TikTok. Instagram, all the platforms, just like me. And then we have our uh, our first time guest, Union Ashley C A. So just welcome everyone to the Union or Bus podcast. And you know, let's talk about labor and vibe and party all at the same time. How's that sound? So anyway, um just uh That's all we do. That's all we do, right? That's all we do. Is <laughs> I'm a little hungover. Up under the there you go. <laughs> Isn't that the idea? <laughs> yeah. We You're see- a little hungover every episode because you film on Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got on already. Damn it. We're, we're weak. We're weak. <laughs> so I'm going to try to try to make this fun. Anyway, uh, so there's been a lot of talk about the 32 hour work week. Um, uh, I know Bernie Sanders has mentioned it. And it got me thinking, you know, AI. Um, and I think the labor movement can actually use AI to our advantage. And let me tell you why. So the basic fundamentals of human existence, I think about food, drink, shelter, safety needs, healthcare, and AI uh, is a lot allowed to streamline a lot of these things. And my question is, if, if these things are getting easier to facilitate, quicker to facilitate, why don't we have more time off? Why are we working harder? Why are 60% of the U.S. population, probably more, living paycheck to paycheck? People are not being able to pay their rent, pay their bills. And I know that a lot of uh, companies, I was talking to you about that earlier, one, how they subsidize um, research and development. So a lot of companies, with the help of their workforce, help with subsidies, They've been able to to become more successful, but we are a lot of people living paycheck to paycheck. Most people living paycheck to paycheck. I not only think that you're not able to survive, but also I believe that the corporations are stealing time from our family, from our our people. So I'm just going to throw that that out to your union sister or anyone. Uh, Ryan, yeah. Your pen. Um, well, I just have to say that you know obviously like the labor movement does see how important AI is. Um, You know, we had the actors, the Screen Actors Guild that were fighting tooth and nail over some control over how AI affects their industry. And, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the trades, AI wouldn't be able to replace the workers, but they would definitely be able to help the workers. And I think unions are trying to figure out how um, they can use that to uh, the advantage of the workers. Um, unfortunately, AI is still in its infant stages, you know, so like if you try, you know, chat GPT, you'll see that there's very huge limitations to it, that it doesn't write like a person and it doesn't replace people. Um, but as it gets more and more advanced, these are definitely conversations that will need to advance as well. Oh, someone's crashing the party. This is awesome. <laughs> Alejandra, she's mad at me. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. I blame Chris. Alejandra, I'm I'm mad at him in solidarity. I was flipping him <laughs> off the whole time before we went on camera. I you love it. Thank you. It's a little tension. Yeah. yeah. We need this tension. This is planned. <laughs> I didn't get a calendar in- invite either, Slipster. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, um... we keep on. I do want to introduce one of the biggest social media influencers out there on TikTok, Alejandra, all things labor. So welcome. We're just here. Keep you updated. We're just talking about the 32 hour work week and and how, you know, companies are successful, especially trillion dollar insurance companies making all this money 
And it's almost like, um, you know, they're using AI against human beings, denying healthcare claims. I know Cigna got in trouble for denying healthcare claims automatically. And I was like, holy cow, you know, it's like, it's like, I was thinking about Terminator the movie. So anyway, that's what we're talking about. Alana, you want to, I don't know if um, you lost your train of thought or I lost my train of thought, but uh, mm-hmm. you were, you were talking about AI and yeah. And, um, you know, and how that relates to the 32 hour work week, um, you know, is, is still yet to be seen since AI is not really at a point where it would help a lot of us that are in the unions, um, especially, you know, me as a flight attendant, there's no way that AI can do what I do. And um, so, but I also have a very different week work week schedule than most careers. So, um, you know, I'm not looking at AI to enhance anything with my contract other than like maybe you know how it interacts with crew scheduling Mm -hmm. well all i know is social media and the labor movement i mean i once said it on one podcast it's a whole new dimension and the solidarity that's kind of going on excited that uh, labor notes is coming up all of us being able to to meet in person and um just talk about how we are just growing this movement. And I don't think it would be growing if it wasn't for influencers like All Things Labor and the excitement. I remember, I don't, I know I'm going to talk to Ashley uh, on their union, Ashley, California, but let me tell you when All Things Labor started following me. <laughs> On uh, TikTok, yeah, I, I couldn't hear. The, I, I didn't hear the end of it. Yeah, I was bragging. <laughs> I was like, "This on, I go check this out." Blah blah blah. I go, "Okay, there, I made it." So, but <laughs> I remember how good it felt, and I just want you to know that we're all here, and you know, we want you to to grow with all of us together. And I don't know. Tell us, tell us how you're, um, how you're liking social media. I've seen a lot of posts. Of you, Ashley, tell us about it. Oh, um, well, I, I also had the same sentiment with um, Alejandra. Like the everything that she shares, <clears throat> that you share, is so amazing because um, you kind of like speak to the heartbeat of how people feel, like uh, the people actually feel, and then like tap into that and then like expose it for everyone to like connect with and relate to, and it's like so satisfying. Um, so, and I think that that was like probably influential for me to start also being more vocal. And I had, I actually have a TikTok too with Dino Skies, like D I N O Skies. Um, because when I started it during the uh, pandemic and you had to wear masks, and I brought like a dinosaur mask um, to work. And so the very first TikTok I made was like wearing a dinosaur mask over my, like with my uniform on the plane. The plane was empty. Um, there were no passengers. We were flying over, uh, to Hawaii from Oakland and because everything was locked down. So anyway, that's, that's the origin name. And I, but the, the video is not there anymore. (laughs) So since then it's changed over to, uh, being, uh, focused on union and labor movement related things. And, um, for a long time, I was actually discouraged, uh, by people, in my union and at work because we have really strict social media policies. I'm sure Elena can speak to this too. Um, like to not be vocal about anything related to union stuff or work stuff. And um, basically around six, seven months ago, I said, screw it. And just started like going off on there and like talking about stuff and just like, instead of trying to get permission as like a committee person where I was constantly getting shut down, I was like, now I'm going to speak I'm going to speak about it because everyone needs like there needs to be some kind of bridge between like leadership and what's happening and what the current events are because there's so much going on and our members and because we are flight attendants we're so isolated in the work that we do from each other and like the labor movement is so much rooted in connectivity and like communication and like feeling um like deeply like it's collectivist right rather than individualistic which is more capitalist so it's like uh that was i was like i'm just gonna start doing it and people started reaching out to me from like everywhere people i've never met 
that are just like, thank you so much for talking about this, for revealing this, for like making it make sense for me because I felt so disconnected from what was going on. So like that has been the most satisfying and of course reinforcing part of doing social media. Ashley, I'm so sorry that was your experience with, um, you know, your union. Mine has been totally embracing. Like my national officers were telling me how much they love what I've been doing for the labor movement. Um, you know, we do have restrictive social media policies at my airline as well, but everything I do is a protected concerted activity. And so like, I, I hope that people will start to see that with the work that you're doing. And sometimes it just takes that trailblazer to be like, you know what, this, this message I have is bigger. And like, you know, as people, um, you know, because unions are very protective of their communications, but as they see the great things that happens with it and they see that they're not threatened by it, I think that that um, is going to change. You know, we've, we're all in this together. And no one wrote yeah, a book I, about anyone that was safe. You know, uh, what? I said no one's <laughs> ever written a book by anyone that was safe. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. He, was, yeah. he bought a house, he got married, you know, had some kids. I, right now, it's right now, labor is just hot and we just got to go. And um, there is going to be pushback. There is always going to be pushback. And um, we get pushback all the time here. Yeah. Uh, since we started this podcast, when we brought on Cornell West, uh, I had like a big old labor leader here in San Diego. Juan, I don't understand. What are you doing bringing on the spoiler? And I was like, first of all, if we're a threat to Biden, you guys got bigger problems. Like we had, we had like a hundred subscribers on YouTube. I'm like, man, like, like really? That's yeah, awesome. Uh, labor and politics is a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, uh, Alex, knows. Alex knows, but yeah. Oh yeah, it's a it's a lot. <laughs> I think, but it's kind of like we're adapting to this. This is new. This new frontier kind of deal. We're like the right. pilgrims going to the west. In a way, we're just learning the terrain. I know it's a bad analogy or a bad comparison, but still, like, we're we're navigating with social media, with our jobs. Our jobs are institutionalized. They've been here for hundreds of years, some of these organizations, and they have bylaws, they have rules, and this is how they've right. been doing it forever. My, I, I'm in the stagehands union. We're a trade. It used to be all white male since till like, the early 2000s, and then that's when we started getting... I think we got the first woman sworn in in the early 2000s, so... That's just what it is. I think labor is that. It's what, as a history, it's an institution, it's an organization, and it moves slow. But we're over here trying to run at 100 miles an hour with social media. And sometimes we get in trouble. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't, sorry. What? I was going to say that, Lena, that, that I, what has happened because of the shift and like constantly putting stuff out there, the response has actually been like, oh, we love this. So it was like somebody just needed to do it. And now other people are doing it and other people are more vocal and other people are making videos. And I'm like, perfect. That's exactly what I yeah. dreamed of. It's yeah. Yeah. And I feel like one of the OGs definitely was like Union Drip with like like John and, and like everyone, um, the other homies also uh, uh, run it. Because for me, it's like, I I don't know, I'm, I'm like a younger millennial, but I everyone always says I act like a Gen Z. And um my Gen Z, my actual Gen Z sisters are going to call me cringe for that. But um, I, I felt that same sentiment when I went to Seattle because I was interviewing some workers for this project that I was doing and someone tagged Union Drip. I had, I, I didn't know that the tag on Twitter and then you guys like um, reposted it. And I was like, oh shit, this is so cool. You know, and it was, and it was just kind of in that community, like you were saying. Actually, also hi to everyone. It's like so nice to see all my fucking comments here. Like, um, <laughs> y'all are super dope. But um, but yeah, it's like I think that that feeling, that feeling of having kind of community, and for me being like a like a first gen woman of color, it's a huge thing, and it made me feel right at home right away, because like that is literally what I'm used to, and I feel like I didn't feel that in the nonprofit sector world that I did, even though it was actually immigration. But the way that work fucks with you um it's really difficult to feel that sense of like community and and camaraderie but i feel like like what we're doing now is you, we're troublemakers anyone who's really involved i think with uh 
with labor notes, you have to be a troublemaker. And I think having a sense of kind of like the humility too, of like being experimental is what I tell workers all the time. Like if you're interested in doing things for social media, like it's trial and error. You know, I was making some dumbass shit at the beginning of TikTok that was not hitting. Some of the things still don't hit and that's fine. But I think as long as we're remembering that if we're able to build that connection to have one worker, you know, stand up for themselves. It doesn't necessarily have to be an immediate union election, but it's one worker understanding that we have the common interest of fighting for a better workplace because yeah. it is going to have a ripple effect. And I think that's what's so incredible of social media. Like if it wasn't for social media, like I wouldn't be here knowing all of you guys. You know what I mean? Like just like that ass, I guess it's the truth, you know? Yeah. My, my 17 year old, um, filed a complaint with his work because he wasn't getting paid for his breaks. And, uh, he got something today from California, from the state of California. I mean, this, this kind of shit, I mean, when I was his age, we never, I, you know, I mean, I, I worked at Mervyn's when I was like 15, 16. Mervyn, Mervyn shout out. R.I.P. R.I.P. Everybody's back to school gear came from Mervyn's. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure there was all kinds of labor violations left and right going on out working there, especially as, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of, like the younger generation is not taking shit anymore. They're like, no, we, you know, I, you know, I don't care what the economists say, all this stuff, we can't survive. You know, it's like they can, especially, you know, navigating that, especially as he's about to go to college. I'm just like, fuck, you got those articles in the Wall Street Journal saying $90,000 a year for college and why they're saying that's okay. I'm like, this is not okay, you know? And uh, so what we're doing here in social media just like spurring on like the younger generation to even be like wait there there's the opportunity to have something better and need to just take you know shift on surfing you know uh, just run is uh, that's essentially all we're trying to do here so and and do you think because there's a new push there's new energy there's a lot of activism the tiktok ban do you think maybe that has something to do with the tiktok ban um I have my own theory, but what do you all think why they're trying to ban TikTok? Yeah, that's, like, this is our connection point, right? Like, or, you know, using social media, it just like uh, what um, John was saying that the like work environment for like even young kids that I'm thinking, I used to work at like Subway and I worked like obscene hours and I, I like stayed way late. Like it was so wrong. And I started when I was 15 and I'm like, but like the environment was that I was working with the older people who are like, do your time. You have to do this. <clears throat> this is just how it is. And like, yeah, um, you know, deal with it. And that's the same with the industry now too that I'm in. But the uh, thing is now you can go on TikTok and people will be like, no, this isn't right. And here's why. And then like, this is how I'm feeling. This is how it's affecting my life. I, I can't like feed myself, but I'm like giving myself away to this corporation. Like what's going on here? There's something wrong with that. And if we can all connect on that, and it's like, oh, well, what are we going to do about it? You know, and that's how we're doing something. Juan just brought that up. You know, why do they want to ban TikTok? And that's why I lifted up my camera and took a picture of all of you. That's why they want to ban TikTok. They want to prevent this type of collaboration where all unions are coming together. All unions are collaborating. And, and that's, and it's like, when I um, see you're going to Chicago, right, Ashley? You said? Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's like, I feel like, I think that's it. It's like, and I knew Alana when I first met her, we were collabing, but I already okay. knew her. It's like, I already knew Alejandra. I knew you and I already vibe. So when it's like, hey, how's it going? It's like, it breaks down those barrier barriers and it creates solidarity. I guess I kind of, I kind of have a hot take on this. I don't think that they're trying to ban TikTok. I think they're trying to distract half of the United States population who is on TikTok from having the important discussions that we were having, you know, about freeing Palestine and about holding Israel accountable and all the people that are giving them money. Um, I don't think that they're trying to ban us at all. I think that the House did that vote in a, you know, an act of politic theatrics and it's mm -hmm. not going to go anywhere in the senate and i think that biden even like kind of hinted towards that when he said you know if they if they approve it i'll sign it like kind of i'd freaking dare you is what they were you know going for um 
And, you know, I think that it's just another way that they're trying to make us fall in line. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I do think, I mean, I think it's also just like a mix of different things. I do, like, I genuinely think that they, they're trying to figure out how they can make money off of it because now they're pissed that they can't and that they can't steal our data. It's like you are already doing it, but they want to be able to have a monopoly on that too, right? And I do think it's actually a distraction. And I had a, a comrade of mine who has a friend that works in the White House. And when everything was happening, um, you know, in, in Palestine, when genocide was starting, um, there was like, you know, the rumors. Someone, someone told someone that told my friend, right, that Biden's biggest worry was that labor unions were going to start putting the pressure on on him to actually do something about it. And, you know, anyone who has connections or worked closely with, like, the bureaucrats of labor, you understand they're very much in bed with the Democrats, right? And that's a whole other discussion we can talk about another day. But, um, but I think at the end of the day, that's why it's so important for people like us, like workers, actually, for rank and file, people who are, who who make up our unions, right, um, get very involved. And we've seen it happening. Like, we, we've seen, like, the power of rank and file organizing, because that's the only thing that matters. We've seen the power of rank and file organizing being able to push their unions, massive unions that have fired, that have fired their, you know, when they, I don't want to say names, they had fired individuals who, who were, taught, were speaking out about the atrocities that are happening, and they were let go. And what happened, those same unions are now writing a letter, a public letter stating, like, yes, we are calling for a humanitarian ceasefire. Which, by the way, does mean both sides. Like, yes, you know. Um, but clearly there's one that's, yeah, anyways. But yes, like, clearly there's power in, in our labor unions. And I do think kind of having that, having us understand that, making that connection and also making it worldwide is one thing that they don't, they don't want. So it's kind of a yes and like those those things kind of go together it's all it's a broad stroke with the whole action to try to get to to ban it whether it's real and intended to execute or not yeah no i think with the ceasefire uh here in san diego we just passed a resolution at the labor council we're behind the scenes me and chris making phone calls having beers talking to the e-board and um yeah. And, but we were talking about a ceasefire, of course, like everybody here with the beginning from October, but labor is slow. It's slow. They have e meetings and then they're monthly. So there's a process, there's a chain of command, but we were talking behind the scenes, partnered up with a friend that's in the community. And then we just got them to do the, we actually, I believe that the LA Fed copied us. They got wind of us doing it, whatever. And then they signed it right before us. And then we did it. So now I'm a, I'm trying to pass it at the state. Uh, I'm calling people to pass it with the state fed, with everybody, really. We're trying to pass it here at city council, uh, San Diego city council, because I told Chris, hey, check it out. Once politicians start saying the word ceasefire, it's a good and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because uh, it's what we I feel is a bad thing. Like they finally gave it like, okay, well, the momentum's there. I can't be the only jackass not saying the word. But once they say the word, now it gives space for everybody else to say it. All these other little politicians around, they're like, well, fuck it. If Biden said it, now I can pass the resolution myself. So I don't know how I feel about that. To tell the truth, I'm kind of indifferent. I guess more resolutions is better. But I feel now it's like a thing. It's cool. Now it's okay to say it. And everybody has to catch on at this point. Um, I, I, If I can add really quickly, uh, Juan, just because I, I could... I completely agree, and I think it could be a double-edged sword, but I, I think this is where social media gets very interesting because clearly, like, social media has been around, but, like, and also the uh, the Free Palestine movement has been around forever as well. But, like, the, the traction that is occurring right now, uh, I do think has a lot to do with, with social media, with Gen Z, um, with the fact that we can see these atrocities. We're not, like, you know, it's not behind closed doors. Um, but I, I think one of the things that Palestinians have been asking us specifically has been to continue to talk about it, right? So, like, you know, people will make a, a statement of, like, well, what does the resolution from the state of Oakland have, or the city of Oakland mean? Like, why does that matter? And it matters because people are talking about it. And people that would have never spoken about it, like, literally five years ago, even two years ago, they would have never spoken about it, you know? And, and that's powerful. 
And I think that's a really great reminder for us of the power of organizing, of what it takes. First of all, the struggle, how hard it is, and but what, what like what we can do when we organize. And like I'm telling you, like I had multiple DMs from different people and different unions being like, "Yo, connect me to people that you know." from like state to state because we're working at, with our local unions because we're going to push national to push this shit. You're like, that's, that's a huge thing, you know? And that, and those connections are being made because we're, we're unionists. We, we're in this, like, you know, it's like, you know, we we're talking about in the past, like, we don't necessarily like know each, I've actually had, I was switching up to actually all of you in person now. Um, but so some folks that I, that's, that are my comrades that I speak online, I've never met in person. But it's like we know that we have the same values and then we're able to make those connections to other people that we that they can get connected to to do some other really dope important shit. Right. And I think uh I think it's cool also to be union, hence union drip. And I think that's why uh John made that handle because it's cool to be union. By the way, for we didn't plan this, okay? We just woke up and we wore the same shirts. We didn't <laughs> we didn't coordinate. It, that that would have been weird. But yeah, though, like John. Remember when we met last year at the ADEMS convention, yeah. um, like how you felt when, when your union sister followed you and all things yeah. followed you. Mm -hmm. And then I got your number, John, no big deal. Uh, <laughs> out there in LA, I felt like, a, yeah, like a high school kid. I was like, man, this is so cool because the celebrities yeah. are, are, is this, this is the cool thing right now. And hence the union drip handle. And you've been so that's, successful that's with that. So that's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? No, I'm joking. I say I drive a UPS truck for a living, so I ain't that cool. But you know, I'm just <laughs> yeah. You're probably like one of the coolest guys here. <laughs> I mean, you guys have a calendar, so. You? <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for she's gonna throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm definitely calling that out. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Okay, I lost my train of thought. I was gonna. I was gonna. Go I was, well, and you haven't even seen the calendar yet. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. All right. I was. I was gonna. I was gonna. I wanted to go back to the the AI stuff because everybody's getting attacked for on AI is coming for everybody's job kind of deal. I, um, I think that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, Chris mentioned the Terminator movie, but first it came for warehouses jobs. Then it comes for drivers. It's coming for uh, our jobs too, and the industry for stagehands. They're they're now putting like sensors on artists, so that the cameras just follow them without a camera operator, without a spotlight operator. They just motion detect the spots that the artist has on them. But we're we're moving in that direction too, even our industry. So I tell Chris, I was talking to Chris this week. Uh, I was thinking like. Labor, we're speaking and having conversations in this spectrum. Like we're we're only allowed to speak between these conversations. They say, but I think labor, us, the activists, need to jump outside of that and and talk about the four day work week. Talk about universal health care. Talk about UBI because AI is taking a lot of these jobs. It's a matter of time. I, the way I look at it, like. Yeah, we want to protest people for the self checkout lanes at Vons, but we know corporations. Corporations are corporations. They're going to do what it takes to make profit, and they own the politicians. So, well, you know what? Jobs would be great for AI to do is management jobs, like the CEOs, the upper management. That's what analytics. It's numbers. That stuff AI is great that's at. A, yeah, that's a. Good yeah. CEOs, yeah, that'd be fine. You can save a ton of money in getting rid of CEO Fuck. salaries. Fuck. <laughs> My mind is exploding with all of the issues with like, um, like, uh, basically, uh, racism that's sort of like built into the infrastructure of AI and like how that impacts like the people too. So I don't I, like I sort of panic at the same time with that idea because I'm like, oh, but we already have a problem with the way that it like analyzes data, right? So it's like are we going to perpetuate more of those issues and most likely yes but, but i mean it's hard it's a hard thing to uh you know to evaluate and analyze yeah i think ai uh, the the only one people that are sharing in the prosperity of ai are the billionaires are the billionaire class they you know they not only share uh, a greater uh greater profits but also time 
And why don't we have more time off? It's a yeah. simple question. 32 hour work week, to me, that makes complete sense. You know, people, you know, what about the mental health crisis? Why are we not able to have more time off with our families? Uh, we have CalCare. You just said CalCare is 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 moving through uh, California's legislature. You know, these trillion dollar insurance companies, could they be run by AI? <laughs> like a lot, Lana said, but no, it's AI is, is used in a weapon. In some in some cases, denying claims. Union drips. Do we start a labor party? Go. Oh shit. Let's do it. Oh, there you go. There you go. We've been sanctioned. We've been there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? All things labor around the and this party labor party uh, thing, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, I I completely agree. We we need to we need to detach. We need to stop sucking ass to the Democrats um, because. Um, Look, I'm not saying that there's not some great Democrats out there, um, very far and few in between. Um, but I think the fact that we do it as a default, and I'm saying this as someone who, who was like, who used to be like, well, blue, no matter who. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'll take accountability to that's what I grew up believing, you know. And I'm still a registered Democrat. Um, but I, I think even it was also my own ignorance. I'm not understanding how important local elections are, how important state elections are. And I think this perspective of being like, okay, it's all blue, it's fine. Or, you know, representation. Um, like it's a person of color, it's fine. That's not the case, right? Um, for it, it does, it's not always the case. Um, but uh, that's why if we can have our own labor party, I think that would, I think it'd just be more beneficial to workers. You know, I was the Union or Bus podcast is always about uh, the or you know the foundation of it is is kitchen table economics. You know, um, you know Juan and I have different you know views on on social issues, but I think right now um, the way things are going, the basic fundamentals of human existence need to be a priority. You know, food, drink, shelter, or you know people are talking about other things, but there's a pyramid. You know, and um, not talking about, I'm talking about just being able to live. We have a huge homeless problem. It just, people just can't afford it. Living wage, it has to be talked about. I mean, if they can distract us with social issues and then we end up being divided, that's going to hurt, you know, what we're all trying to fight for. Um, I, I always said, you know, there's an old, I, you probably heard me say this a lot of times, but you know, there's an old proverb, uh, my, I'm Christian, my dad's Hindu and the old proverb in India is like, uh, after you cut off someone's nose, there's no point in giving them a rose to smell. So after you demean what someone holds is valuable, you know, you could tell them the truth, but they'll never believe you. And that's why social issues, you know, are very, very, you know, uh, are, are valuable to people and kitchen table economics. I mean, right here, you know, this is our chance to just really, to really start and, and, and to, to kind of have a labor party. Basically I'm saying let's have a labor party and, and be able to, to rally around, you know, giving people healthcare, giving people a living wage, giving people what they need. And so, and I think like the idea of a labor party, obviously it's like, okay, go ahead and start a labor party. It's going to be like an uphill battle, blah, blah, blah. And like, by the time you get there, you're not going to win. That's not the point. The point is to garner this energy that's labor and union and the labor movement and become a threat to establishment to both the Democrats and Republican. And then you, you, you guide the conversation this way more. Once you become a threat, that's when you have power. You don't have power when you already give it away. When you already, oh yeah, Biden, you're my guy, this and that. I just, I just had someone uh, post on Facebook. I don't get into arguments that much on social media like I used to when I was dumb, mer. Um, but somebody <laughs> posted about like, oh, this is the most election, important election of our lifetime. Blah blah. Like I, we've already heard this over and over again. And I said, I don't know, I don't, I'm not that cool. With genocide, ha ha. You know, try to play it off. And then, yeah, like people would just start coming. And, but I think though, like one of our close friends, she's Muslim before October 7th, she would tell me like, Juan, you don't understand what it's like to be a Muslim woman in the U S Trump was horrible to us. He's horrible. 
Now, after October 7th, she says, dude, my community can care less about Trump or Biden. Like, that's that's it. Like, they're done. Their red line is, he's crossed it over and over again. So I think now the conversation is, it's no longer in the spectrum, like I say, like I said earlier. It's more like we have power now when we become a threat. And look at the uncommitted votes that are happening across the U.S. That's that's powerful. That's sending a message. But it's not you committing your vote already that you have the power. It's you holding it back to the general election. The general election is still seven months from now. So I've been saying for a very long time that we need a labor party. And the reason for it is that we cannot trust Democrats to look out for labor. Um, you know, there, there's there been many times that Democrat candidates have stabbed labor in the back after being elected by labor. And, um, you know, really there is not one person serving in the United States Senate, Senate or Congress that has to worry about what temperature they keep their home at and what their bill's going to be. They don't have to worry about clipping coupons. They don't have to worry about how much the gas prices are because they get so much money from special interests that um, are basically writing the laws, handing it to them, and then they're signing it to get that money. And so we need people that are going to be, you know, and I feel like when you actually do the work of a true class struggle union, not the business unions, but when you do the true work that it takes to represent members, you're a little um, immune to the kind of corruption that we see. And we need people that know that we're not better than the next person, that homeless person on the ground. We're only we're only like one or two paychecks away from being that homeless person on the ground. And so we care about them and we see them as a person, you know, so that's why we need a labor party. I, I completely agree. I don't know if you guys saw on More Perfect Union just recently posted that like 2% of the legislator for like the, the, like the U.S. legislator is working class. Did you guys see that post? Which is like, I want to act like I'm shocked, but it's also like not really shocking. But I think it, stay, having that also just love per, More Perfect Union, but having the, that visual understanding of being like, holy shit. So these are individuals who make this argument that they understand working class issues. Like, do they even give a crap that the 99 cent store is closing? You know, like, yeah, ex exactly. Like, and that's, that's a huge, that's, I mean, that's, that's honestly what I lived off when I was in college. Like, that's where I was getting my groceries. Um, and I just feel like, so I, I agree. I agree with what you guys are saying in terms of like, I feel like DSA does that as well. Does it really good of kind of like being, being a troublemaker to the Democrats of like, I mean, also has their own issues, obviously, but like being kind of like a, like a pain on the side of the Democratic Party, especially like in local elections. Cause it's like, you want to run this shit, but like, I'm sorry, it was DSA that had my, my coworkers back to working and I think it's DSA that's out of the picket line. You know, it's people that are left. It's not, you know, it's not always yeah, politicians so are the goats for a photo op. You know what I mean? Like, get, you know, get your ass out there and, you know, walk the line. And then, and oftentimes, that's why I think it's important. Like we're, like you were saying, Juan, regardless if, if it's like we're going to be winning or not, we need to be a pain in the ass and we need to be true troublemakers to be able to, like, to let them know that we're willing to take our vote somewhere else and we're willing to, like, escalate to be able to get wins for a working class. I, I resonate with all things you guys are saying having just uh run a senate campaign six months uh, in california and uh all the bullshit that i had to deal with and now you know the person that's gonna the democrat that will win it was fully opposed by california labor but uh, just because the bullshit the democratic party puts up with this guy's gonna be there now i, I i'm only gonna say so much because i don't want to get into you know more trouble than i need to be but um <laughs> but you know i mean my wife ran for state senate, for those of you who know here and uh and you know we we came with four thousand votes at the end uh yeah. from the debt to the four thousand votes less than the debt uh, the, than the party in north yeah. Canada. Yeah. so i mean we did it we did a killer job but you know uh at the end of the day, you know, the, the person's going to be there has, has opposed labor their whole life and they're a Democrat, you know, it's, it's just, you know, and then, uh, you know, I'm not a, uh, 
I'm not a, a, I have a, a duty to work at least party and DSA, in fact. Um, you know, and I, I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait a second, John. Uh, can, can, can we get muted? Because I feel like I'm hearing a lot of background noise for everyone who's like not talking. I'm not sure just me. But... Can they hear it or am I tripping? I hear it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can, uh, can we mute ourselves like, except John? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, uh, okay. Um, I was going to say, I, I am a dues paying member to WFP and DSA, but, uh, I'm not very active in, in either, to be honest with you, but WFP is doing a convention in May and, uh, it's the first time they've done a state one in San Francisco. So I'm going to try to get involved there and I'm, I'm interested in hearing what their thoughts are. Cause I know I have, uh, a teamster member that's from New York city that that works in Sonoma County now. There's a driver uh, at UPS, and uh, he was very involved with working families back in New York. So he said that whoever they supported was the person that he would vote for. So I'm interested in seeing them help hopefully build some sort of power here in California. So just my two thought, my thoughts on that. Thought about my, my mom, and this is sort of an analogy. When she was a little girl, um, she told me that she only thought that the Yankees and the Giants were allowed to play in the World Series. She said that that's what she thought, that those are the only two teams that were allowed to play. And she was just a little girl, um, but she told me. And, and um, I think people, that kind of sense of, I mean, there's defeatism mentality. Can you imagine if people go, oh, we can't get rid of slavery. It's too hard. People like the people that are those things that are really hard to do. I think that's why we're all here together, you know, to to do the hard things that people don't want to do. They'd rather acquiesce in the position of billionaires or millionaires. And we're really, we are the trail, trailblazers. We are saying, you know what? We'll start a party. We don't give a fuck. Yeah. Yeah, if we don't take advantage of this moment, it's over. That's the way I look at it, too. Like, moments come and go, and now is the moment. Now is the moment that we've had the most strikes in the past five years and in the past 60 years combined. Now is the moment where whatever Sean Fain says, everybody's tweeting it and looking at it and, and loving it. Sarah Nelson, uh, Sean O'Brien. <laughs> The whole thing with Sean O'Brien, the Teamster thing, and I and I said it. I I got shit on there for on Twitter for some reason, <laughs> but um, like when he interviewed Trump, and then everybody <laughs> went at it, and I was like, hold on, well we don't know what he's doing exactly. He's like, there's things that happen behind the scenes. We know that. I think Sean O'Brien is the type of guy that wants to be a, a thorn on the Democratic side, wants to not just pledge his loyalty to the Democrats, and he wants to, he wants to basically like scare them that's what i think that was and then he interviewed biden i saw um so i don't know where that that's at now <laughs> i don't know where it's at now <laughs> i'm guessing he's gonna endorse biden because so did uaw but um but that's interesting though right like how the labor whatever labor is doing and saying everybody's paying attention that's the hashtags right now that's where everybody's gravitating towards right now and that's why this is the moment this is the mo if we were to start a labor party, it's like now. <laughs> and yeah, I I got I got to jump on what you're saying there, Juan, because I hate to say it, you know, I work in a building with a few hundred Teamsters, and there's a shit ton of them that are Trump supporters. I, I bet. At the end of the day, I was having a conversation. I was in I was in City last weekend, and I was uh, I went to this art show. Um, my wife's from the Congo, and so this woman hosted someone from the Congo at her house, and this woman uh, was neighbors with Barack Obama in Chicago. And so she was like having this come, you know, it's San Francisco. It's a lot of wealthy people to come from the East Coast. They live here. And she's having this conversation. Like, I just can't understand how anybody would vote for Trump. And I'm like, I'm like, look, the, people have economic anxiety right now. Like they're, they're struggling, they're suffering. And it's like the Democrats, you know, she was talking about how the economy is so great. And it's like, yeah, but for who, you know, like for the working people, the economy's not, we're still struggling. We're having this conversation with AI. Yeah. AI is going to shoot stock prices up, but we're, guys are getting laid off, you know? And so that is where you could make an argument for a labor party is that there are these people who, you know, I mean, of course, a lot of their views are already messed up in the fact that they're supporting Trump. 
don't get me wrong. There's a that, that's a whole nother discussion. But at the end of the day, a lot of them also hate the Democrats because they they suffer with this anxiety of how am I going to make you know my next my rent check and so on and so forth. And that's where you know as a Labor Party we can come in and say, look, we're you know um, not that those other issues are not incredibly important. They are they are, they are labor issues. But those are the things I think that they would resonate with that would make them want to join something like that. You know, 20 years ago, um, it's we had a strike in 2003, 2004. We're out strike four and a half months. And I'll never forget, there was a guy named Nathan. And we both showed up. I was the picket captain. And he would show up with me at six in the morning every day. And uh, uh, he, we would talk because he was pro-life. And at the time I was pro-choice and we would go back and forth. He was out there on day one and 139 days later, he was out w with me four and a half months later. And it wasn't our, po our, our views on social issues. It was the labor movement. It's keeping us together. We can have those conversations, but at the end of the day that we were there for a cause. And I think that that's something uh, there's pro-union Republicans, there's pro-union independents, there's pro-union Democrats, there's all kinds of people. And I just think with everything going on, we do need a change. We need to bust up these monopolies because that's what I think they are. And then we said our Labor Party, um, all things labor, are you going to run? I know you said you wouldn't on the last podcast episode, you were like, fuck no. But we didn't talk about <laughs> Labor Party. You know, we're talking about a Labor Party. So um, I think we need... no. Oh, shit. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I have, I am, uh, yeah. No, no. I'll help anyone else who's running, but absolutely not. Um, I have to say, I like you guys. You guys, Juan, run. <laughs> and now it's just no. So I see progress. I don't know about you guys, but. No, uh, see, I can't run. I, ha I said way too much fucked up shit in the early 2000s on Facebook. <laughs> And well, and messages. you you have a low sellout rate too. Yeah, what did you say? It was three hundred grand. <laughs> and the Jeep Wrangler. Juan's gonna sell out some three hundred thousand yeah. dollars. <laughs> Easy. Easy. So that's why we the moment is now. We gotta make as much change now. We got two years, so we all sell out. We're all gonna be working for Biden. <laughs> I ran for office. Uh, they spent uh, the oil and gas company spent a million dollars against her. And I'm like, you should have just fucking called me up and offered me the check. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, we should tell the, the billionaires that are listening right now, like, all right, if you want us to shut the hell up, it's gonna cost you a couple, a couple of sacks, and we'll <laughs> we'll get rid of you in your bus oh, and get rid of you in your drip. <laughs> all the workers all they want, and they could still exploit the shit out of us, honestly. Yeah. That, you know, looks I, like... <laughs> I'm taking baby steps. I I probably will end up running um someday. Like I I ran for union office. Um, and then like I, I'm our government affairs local rep here and I started noticing like the different committees, like the unpaid stuff that we really do need labor unions on, um, like the corporation commissions, the, you know, industrial commissions. Um, and I saw that my local uh, aviation advisory committee had a seat open and literally none of the people that are on that aviation advisory committee work in aviation like there, there was a guy that he sells cars and it's like what is he doing on an aviation advisory committee so i put my name in and wrote to my mayor and said hey i work in aviation i have for 13 years i've lived underneath the flight path in our city for the past 17 years like you guys need to put me on here <laughs> so we'll see i mean they know i'm union so we'll see uh what that does but i'll eventually do it I think the people that are the best politicians and leaders are the people that don't want to do it because I think people that want to do it or are born for it, they probably have like some kind of ego, you know, issues, but people like that are activists and they feel like they have to do it. Nobody else is doing it. I'm going to do it. Those are the best people to do it. Alejandra, Alana, do it. Go for it. We'll support you. We can't endorse on the Union the Bus podcast because we're turning into a C3. So we are selling out little by little. <laughs> so now we have to be part of the system. <laughs> we got we got we got two grants coming in. So, <laughs> so we gotta be careful. I think that oh, what God. you're talking about is in an organizing training though. Like they talk about how like the person who's like the pick me for leadership <laughs> is usually 
not the person you want to lift up, right? So like, and that's a huge thing. I don't know. That's like more of a Gen Z term. So I don't know if it's like y'all are like, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's what it yeah. is, right? Like generation people who are like, oh, man, I want to be in the prime. I want to be dominating it all. It's like, uh, that. Yeah. that's like a huge red flag energy with like um, being a union advocate. Like, I think it is always the people who are like, no, 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 no. But I also feel like I, I completely agree. And I also feel like, I think, at least for me growing up as like uh, the Mexican American, like if I wanted to become a lawyer, which is what I wanted to do, thank God I did it. But like, like the perception was it was prestigious, right? It's like, yeah, do it. Because like, there's no one in my family who was a lawyer, no one who's gone to college, no one who's gone to fucking law school. So that was like a big deal. And I feel like for everyone, regardless of race, it's the same thing about being a politician, right? It's like this idea of like, it's prestigious. It's this, it's that. And um, I'm sure you guys get it all the time too, or folks be like, oh, you should work for this, you should work for this, because they think you're well spoken, or they think you're genuine, or this, this, and that. And those are great traits to have, but like that also makes a great organizer. You know, that makes a great community leader. Like, in order to get involved in your community or get involved in your local election, you don't have to run. You know what I mean? Like, get involved, absolutely. But like, I don't feel like the end all should be like you need to have a position. Like, for the folks who like want to do it, go for it but i feel like we also need to we, we, we need to let the youth know that there's other opportunities for you to be able to do really incredible things in my opinion way more important things than it is than just like running for office yeah be a rank and file activist you know at the end of the day i'd rather have 100 of those than one guy who's trying to get to the top i don't know anyone who went to washington dc and came back with a better reputation so it's <laughs> You know, and I talk about senators and congressmen and congresswomen. A lot of them, they develop a record. You know, you votes and and it's hard for them to get elected to uh, become president and stuff like that. It's it's um, but yeah, prestige, power, capital. It kind of reminds me of uh, uh, did you, sociology classes talking about Karl Karl Marx conflict theory and how that you know it, it, it's there. You know, there is that um, hey. I want that notch, you know, I want that. And, um, what do you all see in 2028? Are we going to have a general strike? I know Sean Fain is pushing unions to, uh, end their contracts in May of 2028. Uh, he's ending his contracts then, and he's pushing and encouraging unions to do the same thing, to push for a general strike. I've asked different leaders what they thought of a general, gen I won't name their names. Um, uh, what they thought of a general strike, but they said we don't need one and this and that. But what do you all feel and believe of a general strike? Do we need one? Do you think it's coming? Is that even feasible? I, well, I know that for us as supply tenants, I'm curious what Elena has to say about this too with the RLA is like, it's super comp I, Like I, I love it. I love the idea, um, but I can't like formally endorse it because it's, a uh, very spicy area for us as flight attendants. Yeah, I, I think that it'll be interesting to see if, if he's able to line up other unions' contracts. You know, it's it's really hard to um, get labor unions on board with following a different labor union's leader, <laughs> you know? Um, so, like, good luck with that, number one. Like, I wish him all the best, but you know, to um, have all those like egos working on like, oh, he's the leader of this. I don't think that'll ever happen. But then um, on top of that, like there are, you know, a lot of industries that are union are governed under, under the National Labor Relations Act, which you guys can all go on strike as soon as your contracts are done. They expire. As uh, Union Ashley said, and they're totally right, we um, we don't have that luxury. We're under the Railway Labor Act, which um, has basically muzzled our industry and taken away our strike power and, and kind of muted it. Like we have to ask permission from the government to be able to go on strike. Um, you know, otherwise it's an illegal action. But, you know, the hope in that is that we've seen industries like the teachers who are not able to strike either. It's also illegal for them. And, you know, they just said, fuck it. They can't arrest all of us. And, you know, maybe flight attendants will get that way. We have that kind of solidarity where our leaders don't have their egos mixed into it as much. 
<laughs> but they are willing <laughs> to like work together to, um, you know, we just saw the worldwide day of action with flight attendants with the three largest flight attendant unions. And I think that we are willing to work in unison like that in order to combat some of the issues that we have with the Railway Labor Act. But, um, you know, let's let's see what happens with all of you on the NLRB who have, uh, you know, expired contracts where ours just become amendable and we have to work under that oppression forever until we get a new contract. And that only happens when our CEOs decide that they've made enough money off of our backs and made their um, their board of directors and their investors happy enough off the off of our labor, off of the money that they owe us. So we'll see. I'm I'm skeptical. We had Nina Turner on our podcast, and I remember talking about. I go, hey, you know, Nina, if everyone just walked outside right now, we're not going back to work until everyone has health care. Everyone would have health care. It's just it's it's the will, and sometimes. You know, you have to break the law. Um, you know, there's that I, you know, I try to do this. I'm very unsuccessful. I try to put God, wife, children, labor movement in that order. And I mix them up all the time. But I do tell people the story, <laughs> you know. So um, uh, there in, in, in uh, there is a in the Bible, there is a there's a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And he was a mighty king. And you read a lot about him in the book of Daniel. And um, he made a law that said, you have to bow down to this golden image once these you hear the music play. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, well, that would be a violation of their, their that would be against God. So they said, you know, with all due respect, uh, we cannot do that our God will deliver us. And Nebuchadnezzar, you know, say no to Nebuchadnezzar. He was so freaking pissed. He ordered them to be put in the fiery furnace. And it was, he was ultra pissed. So he heated up 10 times hotter and the guard that threw him in, he actually burnt to death. And, but they didn't burn, you know, they were, God turned it into an air conditioned living room. And sometimes if there's a law that violates you know, your, your morals or, you know, there's something there and you need to take a stand. And sometimes it's hard to do the right thing. Think about how much pushback all of us got when we were talking about, you know, what was going on in Gaza. You know, we were going against MSNBC, Fox News. We're going against the, everyone was getting programmed. We're like, no, I go, no, that's, you know, and, and so um, I kind of let people know. And I think in the, you know, it just shows that all of us can stand in solidarity, you know, around different um, economic, around kitchen table economics, what I'm saying. But I just thought that was, it is the will, um, ultimately. Whenever you talk about Nebuchadnezzar, I think about The Matrix. You guys watch The Matrix? No? It's been a minute. Long time ago. It's been a minute. <laughs> Speaking of Cornell West, he was in the Matrix, the first one. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. He's, FYI, he's a council member in there. I do, I do think it's it's important to uh, like lean into a safe zone as far as like when we're talking about like the collective action thing that we can't mess with that. Like as flight attendants, at least not at this stage. And like hopefully things will change on like a legislative level so that I think. Biden blocked uh, actual rail workers from striking as well for, for the same, like, that's kind of like what it leads to, even if you get cleared to strike, like, Biden can just be like, no, nope, we're not going to. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, commerce and economic disruption. So uh, we're not going to allow it. Uh, so I just want to say, like, I, like, we have to be so careful and being like, we don't touch that, not uh, at least not now. But I encourage and support all of the other unions to do what they can, especially with your, um, yeah, like the, I believe in the collective action. It's just that we are in a really particular hole as the flight attendant union people. There's, there's I mean, even, um, even the unions are allowed to do it. There's still a lot of education that needs to be done because so many people, you know, they, they won't do it because they just, they're not educated enough and there still needs to be, you know, it's like, 
as, as as badass as I think a general strike would be, I'm also skeptical too, just that there's enough people that will pay attention or care, you know, so. The, the, and if, I, if, I if unions were really truly interested in doing that, then they'd also be working at a local level to make sure that people that are on strike are able to get, you know, um, unemployment benefits to make sure that there's like debt forgiveness for loans that, um, for, or at least like a, a stop on interest when people are out on strike. But there's a lot of steps that I don't see unions taking right now. I feel like that goes back to our conversation earlier about who's leading our unions, unfortunately, and our labor councils and our differences that we have people that are, that care more about their party platform than actually care about. And I, I'm not speaking for all of them, because obviously I think there are some good people that have moved up through the ranks, but I think that that's part of the discussion that we need to have too is that we need to make sure that we have people that are running our locals and involved in making those policies and stuff on the local level that are people that actually give a shit. Right. That's yeah, kind of I completely thing. agree. Um, Go ahead. Um, you just just uh, to give my two cents about this too, I, I completely agree. John, I think we need, a, we need a lot more education. Every once in a while, I don't know if you guys get it, but I'll get on TikTok every once in a while, like, some pages or hashtag general strike 2023 general strike 2025 you know blah, 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 blah. and it's just like um we need to organize like so for my, my first question is always like is your place to organize no then shut the hell up and go organize it like you know what i mean like this idea i think i think absolutely it would be incredible for us to get there and i think it takes a lot of work though and it takes our you know if we know 80 percent of gen z are you know view unions highly we need to fucking organize them and from what i'm seeing Unions are, I, I was in an interview um, for a job interview the day and I was talking to some uh, folks that were interviewing me and they were like, they're like, we get it. But like labor unions are fucking dinosaurs. They're still in the 1980s. Like you'd be lucky if they're in the 1990s, right? In the way that they are, they move about organizing or they're moving about social media. And it's true. Like, you know, it, it's it's unfortunately true. Um, so I think trying to call just for a general strike without understanding the education that goes behind it, without understanding that it's going to take a long time. So one of the things to shout out to one of my best professors at Cornell, uh, Professor Lieberwitz, when we were talking about the MLRA is like, we need to remember that before 1935, um, there were strikes and they were illegal. And not only did you get your ads beat, you got killed. You know what I mean? And like the workers that I went to, to interview, that's why I'm like, that's why we need like international solidarity, solidarity as well, because some, some uh, union members that I uh, met when I was in Mexico, in, in Puebla, in Guanajuato, they're not, like, I think I said this before on your last podcast as well, but these these workers, is a, you know, it's like these workers are not going, not only going against their union, they're going against their, like, like super business union, their super corrupt employer, boss, like, they're, and they're also going up against the cartel, the fucking cartel, because they're in bed with the fucking union, like, you know what I mean? So it's just like, I, I think you're right, Chris. Like, sometimes we do have to break the law. But the only way we can get to the point where we can break the law is when you know that you have that cost solidarity. I'll say something. I don't want to give too much information. But uh, I was in a workplace where people were like, well, what we, what can we do? It is so scary because, you know, the boss is the main boss. And, you know, da 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 And it's like, yeah. And then and then I reminded my my rank my bargaining unit. It's like, yeah, and we got the fucking power because they're we're their staff. You know, we should we take this shit public. You know how fucking like, you know, like you know what, what kind of power we have. And like, you know, I'm being able to just like organize around that and having incredible coworkers who have so many years of organizing experience to be like, okay, this is how we're gonna do it. This this escalation escalation boom boom boom. And that is powerful. And this is coming from like seven seven people and we're already seeing fucking things that like changed to be able to protect our, our our comrades but in order to get to that level and obviously i think at that when you have seven workers in comparison to like the fight attendants and there's like thousands right or t whatever amount like it's it's gonna take a long time we should look at argentina they did incredible work in terms of being able to get their very catholic country very catholic unionist to do a strike for abortion rights that's wild you know what i mean so we can do it but we just need to be able to like put in that work and it's gonna take a lot from the rank and file i don't give a shit about what leaders are doing it's gonna take the rank and file people like us that are connecting to our coworkers and our friends and families to for them to explain the power of our union when we get involved yeah listen to, i just wanted 
I listened to a lot of um, uh, sermons from Martin Luther King, you know, and he said something in one of the sermons that said, you know, if when you step aside from doing what is right, you die a little inside. And you could be 48 as I happen to be. But if you step aside from doing right, you can step aside from doing what's right. You can live till you're 90, but you're just as dead at 48 as you would be at 90. And it's, you know, right now, right now I'm having the time of my life. You know, I mean, Juan and I say, oh, we only have two more years. We only have two more years. And it's like, this is so, this is historical. You know, I'm, we're documenting this. You don't, you don't know like our reach right now. We are reaching out to so many people. And, um, you know, I know Union Drift's like, I'm just, you know, when he's talking about you, I go, I don't, you know, realize how many people like you help in the labor movement just by retweeting during the strike uh, at Spreckle Sugar. He would retweet it. And all of us kind of stand in solidarity. And uh, and it was that platforming each other. I think that's what it is. We're platforming each other. We're not nest, We're not competing with each other. We're trying to lift each other up. And I think just that's, but that's what I thought of. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard. Are you willing to risk your life for your God? Are you willing to risk your life for your wife, your children, the labor amendment? <laughs> It buys me out. Uh, 300,000? Yeah. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. No, but I think this is exciting. This is fun. I think we're all energized. We're all leaders. We're already successful. I feel you're already successful when you're doing something, when it comes from the heart. We don't have to be doing this. We don't have to start a podcast. You all don't have to be on social media doing what you're doing, but you feel like you have to do it or you, or you love it because you know we're trying to help people. That's it. We're just trying to help people. We're not trying to sell the next cell phone or sell the next car. We're trying to help people get health care, better wages, better working conditions. So I think this is, you're always, who said it? Uh, it was one of those people that we had on the podcast, presidential candidates. They said, um, when you when you fight and you know with your heart, you're always going to win. So I think that's true. You're always going to win. We already won. Um, so yeah, I wanted to go real back to the Railway uh, Labor Act because we had Sarah Nelson on. And then we talked about the the potential strike about for about you all. And then I mentioned the the railway workers too. How Biden stepped in and kind of you know stopped it. And um, and she said we're not in their position. We're not in the railway workers' position. The the flight attendants are way more organized and way angrier than the railway workers. Like they're there. Like they have the organization. Y'all are working together. When we went to labor notes to this troublemakers last year, remember we sat at, yeah. we saw the panel of Amazon Teamsters was there, and uh, and somebody from the railway workers was there, and he broke it down. I took pictures of it. He broke it down how many different unions are part of the railway system, and he's like, don't even worry about what Biden did last year. Sure, he stopped it, but what did he stop? He didn't stop anything. There was no solidarity between uh, railway unions. Each union are always um, like. Uh, raiding each other and then this union was ready to strike but this union had a 30 percent voter turnout so yeah it takes that solidarity and get the workers actually there to be able to facilitate something like this i just i feel like i have to say that it was actually congress that did that oh. it wasn't biden like the the president doesn't really have as much um power as everybody makes it seem under the railway labor act um, it's Congress that's in charge of, of interstate commerce. And so um, what what happens is when we break down our negotiations and it's at an impasse, the National Mediation Board has to declare that it's an impasse. So they'll go through a series of interviewing our negotiators, the company negotiators. And then when they declare an impasse, it puts us in a 30-day cooling off period where neither side can um, use self-help. And, you know, we have to go into what's like a hyper mediation process where they are meeting, trying to nail because they have 30 days to try to get our contract together. And then if that doesn't happen, the president can make a mediation board that um, they meet again and they try to make recommendations. But it's ultimately Congress that votes whether or not we have to accept the contract that the company is giving us 
to break our strike. And um, so that's what happened with the railway workers. And um, unlike railway workers who they're all like all the different railways are all negotiated at the same time. And so there were like eight unions that they liked the contract and they wanted it. And then there were some that didn't. And so, you know, some of the people that are railway workers were happy with what they got. And then they ultimately did get some sick days in that process. But um, with us, you know, we're all separate airlines. We negotiate separately. And so, you know, if one airline goes out on strike, the other ones don't necessarily at the same time. And um, so there is a lot more wiggle room for our unions than there were with the railway. Because with the railway, it was all of them that would be going on strike. And there was no end in sight. And that's something that, um, you know, our flight attendants are very aware of or need to be even more aware of that you know it's a different scenario for us right i just like blaming biden for everything um, i know <laughs> like just like newsome i just like, <laughs> and that? you know he could have been a better advocate for sure he could have been a better advocate and he does have a lot of sway but um ultimately it's it's congress what do you all think is going to happen in the general election we have all of these people running now, um, RFK, Arno West, Joe Stein, and Demo Biden, and uh, Trump. Uh, we, I, we believe that maybe not someone is going to get those delegates that they have to get uh, to win. And if that doesn't happen, then it goes to Congress. Congress elects the president and the Senate elects the vice president. You know, I am thinking about 18, I think it's 1824 with Andrew Jackson when John Quincy Adams got the popular vote. I I think there's, I think everything is up in the air. I don't think time is necessarily on Biden's side. I think time is on the other parties that are involved. I don't, I believe that Biden is going to eventually drop out of the race. I think what's going to happen is they're going to try to push Gavin Newsom. So, um, and then when that happens, that's, you know, there's unanticipated consequences. I don't think anyone has it wrapped up right now. I just think if it was, the election was tomorrow, who do you think would win if the election was tomorrow? Well, they're so old that, either one of them could drop dead and then like, yeah, then we have to start true. from wherever he's just yeah. so, I mean, yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that Biden will drop out. I think that he's in it till he, till he dies literally. Um, so yeah, I think that we're going to be stuck with the two, maybe like RFK or, or some of these guys, let's take their $300,000 buyout to stop splitting the vote. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. Juan, you can work on that with them. Yeah. I reached, I reached out to him. <laughs> Actually, Jill Stein said she would debate RFK on the, on the podcast, but uh, uh, RFK said he's not going to debate. I think, I think it's it's interesting. You know, seven months is a long time, and you start splitting up. You know, and and I just I think people are looking for change, and I think that's why we are talking about the Labor Party, talking about forming a party, because I think we feel that there needs to be something else for people to rally around, and who knows. What's your dream? Your, do you dream that we uh, like figure it out and within the next seven months? Is that no. like, no? I sell out. Because there's a whole lot more organizing, right? I think it's going to take time to, re yeah. Alana, there you go. Yep. Money. <laughs> I think we need to start something now and then, but it doesn't mean you don't stop participating in what already exists in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party, and, and in politics. We have to do everything. We have to be walking through gum at the same time. Uh, we have to have mm -hmm. our people run for office in these parties that exist currently. And then let's create something new at the same time. We should always be with an organizing mindset. We should always be like, this is not enough mm -hmm. because it's not enough. Whatever they've been doing for the past 50 years hasn't been working. So we have to try to change it up. That's what I think. I think everybody deserves health care and everybody should deserve a livable wage. Um, um, I think it's also going to take a lot of us to provide a lot of education on how 
like raising these wages does not mean that they're that it it's like a correlation to like hospitals being more expensive because at the end of the day people have been raising um the bosses the companies have been raising fucking prices for everything i literally i organized my workplace my second workplace with my co-workers i went to grad school i came back i doubled my fucking salary and i'm still in debt and i'm still living paycheck to paycheck and i was like and i would go to the store and i was like damn why the hell is everything so damn expensive but it just everything went up right and it's like and you, so so one of the things i want to say is like i think it's important when we're doing working on these things for us to also talk about how you know because you're we're going to see working class people who are going to complain about it people who also get paid shit who are going to complain about that they're going to say that's going to make everything more expensive though and like we need to make sure that we are providing a lot of education to be like no that's not the case right like that's and, and we do that by having conversations one of my most viral videos was when someone was talk was complaining about how um they're like oh i'm a plumber and why is a fast food worker gonna get paid 17 if i get 17 or some shit like that right and it's just like dog go yell at your boss go fucking yell at your boss because you're underpaid like why are you getting mad at the fucking kid at mcdonald's you know and it's like people like having those conversations i think sometimes juan i'm glad that you're not like maybe getting too many fights on social media sometimes it's fun sometimes we should sometimes we we shouldn't because we shouldn't we should try to invite people who do have different perspectives and that means being able to educate each other have the humility to understand when we're wrong but educate each other to be like no no, no. raising these wages is a good thing amen amen speaking of education i'm actually at an event for save our schools arizona um you know there um the whole education system is under attack here a lot of election deniers trying to get into the school boards and trying to be superintendents um and so unfortunately i have to get going because this event's about to wrap uh, like get ramping again but i just want to thank you all for having me on i really appreciate that and it was so nice to meet you guys and i'm looking forward to seeing you at labor notes those of you that can go and those of you that can't i'm looking forward to seeing you online more Thanks, thanks, Alana. Thanks, Alana. Thank you. Your union sister. Thanks, Alana. Yeah, we've we've been going for a little bit over an hour. Um, that's usually our time too. Um, we have we're gonna shoot two of the episodes today. Our second episode is gonna be with somebody from the iHeartRadio campaign because they're negotiating their contract right now. So uh, we're gonna jump on with them. But any last words? Uh, again, thank you all for jumping on. I know, uh, like this is a beautiful Saturday. Maybe you'd rather be out there in the beach or something. But uh, you're here with us. So <laughs> any last words from you all before we end this awesome episode? Uh, I, I'm just going to add that, like what we've been saying, let's just keep educating people because, you know, we need people to understand why the economy is not working for working people. You know, whether they're, they're people we agree with or not politically, we need to educate them. And uh, we need to, like Alex was saying, we need to organize. That's really what we need to do because as much as... Uh, I love seeing, you know, general strike take place in Europe and so on places that I just wish we had that here. We're not going to get there until we educate the masses, not just our members, but I mean, everybody to understand why we need to be doing those kind of actions. So. Yeah. And I would, and I just want to thank everyone. It's so dope to, to be here Juan and Chris for having all of us. I think it's really important work that you guys are doing. We need to keep educating like John says. And I, I just a reminder there no bill, no legislator, no legislation, no leader, no 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 one, no politician is going to save the working class. We save ourselves and we do that by unionizing. That's that's the only the only thing that matters is we need to unionize our workplaces, all of them. So that's well I'll leave it off. Yeah. Uh, and I just wanna add that the the uh basically the the concept of solidarity is it is hard. It can be really hard, but it is so necessary and we can't be agitating toward one another. We have to agit we have to agitate about really the source of the problem, which is the boss and the laws that like allow the boss to exploit workers. And so like yeah. maintaining that focus is really what's gonna get us the results that we wanna see and actually uh, give us our dignity back and our ability to survive and like thrive in this world. Yeah. 
Perfectly said. And, and by the way, uh, solidarity. We got this from Eugene Tripp. Yes, we stole it from him. <laughs> we have no integrity. We just steal things. <laughs> 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 we borrow. Uh, you, you can steal anything from me. Don't worry about it. So, <laughs> oh, hell yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. All right, everybody. Well, that's another episode of Union or Bust. Thank you very much. And I'll see some of you all at Labor Notes. Bye, everyone. So, thank you, guys. 